So uh, to remind you, I um, last last time we talked about Lyme disease, um, I showed you these crucial pictures, and I'm just starting my talk with that again. You see uh, neurons in the brain. This is the central axon of the nerve. Uh, this layer around here is the myelin sheath, and embedded in the myelin sheath are uh, Lyme spirochetes. And that was uh, the work by uh, Professor Alan McDonald, who showed that every Alzheimer's brain has that as a condition. And so um, I think that's significant. And the trouble I'm having right now is my computer doesn't want to forward. Okay, I'm gonna skip now, like a few uh, things that we went over last time. Um, we ended on this page where I try to hammer down the point that um, when you treat um, a freshly infected person with Lyme disease, with Borrelia burgdorferi, uh, and with an underdosing of doxycycline, like it's typically done, the 100 milligrams twice a day, <clears throat> what you do with that, you're forcing the spirochetes to basically retreat into the cystic form where they're completely invulnerable to the uh, to the antibiotic. And they may also retreat into biofilm colonies where they're also not, uh, can be reached with antibiotics. And then what happens, however, the uh, immune system, cells of the immune system sense that the bugs are there, sense their presence. And then they start attacking every tissue in the body that either is covered with biofilm that has the cysts inside, or the cysts are inside the cells. Um, and then those cells are doomed for destruction by the immune system. And that's a basic mechanism of currently very, very common autoimmune diseases. And there is now hundreds of uh, autoantibodies that you can test for. And you will always, pretty much on every Lyme patient, you will find four or five of them uh, present. <clears throat> and so um, I want to, um, home down on the uh, or narrow down on the issue of the chronic Lyme disease uh, in most cases is an autoimmune disease. Um, however, there is the presence of the bugs in there, but they're in a form where they cannot be uh, destroyed with common antibiotics. Um, and uh, we went through the alternatives, you know, to, to use um, um, flagell, uh, uh, or, or tinidazole as an offshoot, that there's been suggestions that uh, some antibiotics can break these cysts that Lyme is forming. And it's just simply not true. There is not a single piece of research that shows that it's anecdotal. And we've seen that, yes, uh, metronidazole or tinidazole can be an important part of the treatment, but um, they do not destroy the cysts and do not get rid of them. And so, um, we have a different strategy that I will introduce you to. Here's a, a nice picture of how biofilm looks like. So uh, many uh, creatures are joining together in these biofilm cultures are basically forming a new form of organism where different creatures with different types of DNA joining together as if they were one organism. And the, see the strands of poly, uh, mucopolysaccharides, the light conductive is basically a fiber optic system that the bugs communicate with each other at the speed of light. And they do one of the things that's more researched is a quorum sensing, sensing quorum that simply means the bugs sense, uh, they know how much food is available, how much water is available, how much air, how much oxygen is available. And based on that, they determine how many numbers are allowed in their system. Um, and so, and if they reach the max uh, where the food sources are all utilized and there is no extra, they simply stop inviting in new bugs. And so we can always look at the microbiology and know what's going on in the greater world and vice versa. Um, so this, when Lyme hides in, in this, um, it's usually pretty much a pure DNA with very little uh, living apparatus around it um, because it's a shared um, uh, metabolism of this whole organism that actually makes everything work in it. However, the immune system, of course, is aware of it. 
but the biofilms are organized in a way that the immune system cannot get into it and and the immune system goes wild when it's that's just like a, a cat goes wild if it, she knows or he knows that there's a mouse behind the hole in the wall but it can't get to it you know and so the immune system our immune system is the same way it senses these bugs in the biofilm it can't get in there because the biofilm is a shielding mechanism is very very it's like a fortress like fort knox it can't get in there and so the immune system just goes nuts, nuts and attacks everything that smells or um, uh, exerts the same frequencies as the bugs in the biofilm and attacks everything that looks like it. And that's your chronic Lyme disease, you know, with the severe fatigue and severe pain and, and weird neurological symptoms and the buzzing in your brain and the vibrations in your, in your system and all the weird stuff that uh, people experience combined with insomnia and, and being totally exhausted during the day. Okay, here's um, um, from um, friends of mine, like the early, uh, early view of what uh, persistent forms of Lyme look like. They all have different names in medicine for many decades. Schizoaffective disorder, multiple sclerosis, ALS, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, thyroid disease, hyperparathyroidism. We see that quite common, you know, we're always watching the calcium level. If that marches up above 10 or 10.5, people are in grave danger and that needs to be recognized and needs to be uh, dealt with. Um, people develop um, these <clears throat> adenomas, the hypertrophy of one of the uh, parathyroid glands and suffer tremendously. And the moment you pluck that out, it's like a miracle for these people. Um, hypothyroidism, of course, that's so common now that um, it may be Lyme disease, it may not be insomnia. I mentioned autism. You know, 80% of the autistic kids I see are testing positive for Lyme disease or one of the co-infections. And I would dare to say the other 20% a test for infections, I don't have a test for, or I don't know what to look for, but if 80% test for the just a narrow range of Lyme-related bugs, I will show you in a moment what they are. Um, it's likely that the other 20% also um, are uh, infections and what infections they are, we, we get into that. You know, In my autism lectures, I go very, very deeply into which the common infections are and what to do about it. ADHD, behavioral issues, learning differences, you know, all the stuff that young children or our young people have now. Um, it's not just electrosmog, not just the screen exposure and the Wi-Fi exposure, but the Wi-Fi exposure causes a collapse of certain parts of the immune system that makes you a sponge soaking up uh, Lyme-related bugs from the environment. And, and as I mentioned already, but I will mention a thousand times again, it doesn't take a tick bite to get Lyme disease. You can get it from your partner through sex, through kissing. You can get it from spider bites, from stinging flies. You can buy it even from mosquito bites. Um, you, uh, you know, the, it's, and every stinging insect potentially carries one or more of the bugs that we're talking about here. So then there is the spectrum here on the right side of uh, the typical uh, more more established um, autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia, rheumatica, chronic fatigue and uh, ME, they're pretty much now recognized, uh, at least in Germany by the Charité, by the main um, university clinic in Berlin, where uh, Dr. Scheibenbogen is the main specialist on chronic fatigue, and she pretty much nailed it. That's an autoimmune disease. Again, triggered by bugs that are hiding in the system, and then the immune system mounts an um, exaggerated response to that and inflames parts of the brain um, that then will require a two-pronged approach. One is to find the bugs that are causing the upset and take the bugs down, and the other one is to calm the immune system, you know, with anti-inflammatory measures or, um, yeah, more severe medical drugs. That's, of course, in the university environment. You know, we use quercetin and um, other plant-based uh, substances to calm the mast cells and, and other cells involved in this. 
fibromyalgia, chemical sensitivity, bipolar disorder, Addison's disease, really the adrenal fatigue that is so common. And pretty much on all our Lyme disease patients are on the spectrum somewhere. In the early ones, you get an uprising of cortisol levels, and then you get a flattening out, and you get a com complete collapse of inability to produce a DHEA or, or cortisol. And then there is the link with cancer that I can no longer overlook. After 30 years of looking at this, I just see that the Lyme patient is in danger of, um, of cancer. Now, it's interesting. I just taught a cancer seminar in Germany, and I provided the literature that shows people that have a chronic mast cell activation and are in a chronic allergic state are less likely, so that's the, the M1 state of the macrophages, of the activation of the macrophages uh, that Dr. Theo Haridas is lecturing us about. So if people have the activated state of the immune system, the M1 state, they're actually less likely to get cancer. And if they actually move to the M2 state, which is the anti-inflammatory state of the macrophages, there is higher cancer rates there. So a little bit of inflammation is a good thing in your system. You should not try everything you can to calm it down. You should keep a reasonable level of inflammation in your system alive as an anti-cancer strategy. I get to that in my uh, cancer lectures that will be coming up after Lyme. Okay, well, okay. So how do you know you got Lyme disease? Well, the amazing thing is the symptoms are identical, like the symptoms are of heavy metal toxicity, environmental illness, mold exposure, and Lyme disease. They have, the body has only so many ways it can respond to when you have an assault on your system and the body responds with predictable uh, certain ways. And they're the same whether the offending thing is the sort of heavy metal toxicity or it's the chemical toxicity in your environment and your allergic reactions to it, or the mold mycotoxin exposure with the mycotoxin um, um, the, the detox pathways that are involved in chemical sensitivity, heavy metal toxicity, and mycotoxins are the same detox pathways. And with several of the enzymes in there are blocked, you're screwed and you get the same set of symptoms, no matter which one of the three is the trigger and the same applies for Lyme disease. So that's basically the job of us in the clinic um, to discern, um, to get to a likely uh, discernment, which one of these four is the, the crucial issue in the patient. And of course, um, we had a think tank in the early part of the century, uh, which Shoemaker was part of it. And there were all the great heroes of Lyme disease that I adore still to this day. And um, there was a big split in our camp after the think tank, you know, that, that crashed after 2008 when the financial crash happened, then the think tank also crashed with that because it was dependent on um, somebody financing it. And so what we were left with that a subgroup of us uh, believe that as all mycotoxin illness is the first order of the day that that needs to be solved. And then about two thirds of us walked away from the think tank thinking no Lyme is the real crucial issue. You need to resolve that first before you can get to the mold. And I'm certainly clearly in that camp um, because um, I'm just going by clinical results. You know, when we started going wild on the mold issue, which was really in the late part in the 1990s, you know, when I met Richie Shoemaker and we went fully into his, his world. Um, the the uh, overall clinical results um, was maybe 10% or 15% of people had dramatic improvements, but the rest didn't. And then when we shifted to focus on treating Lyme disease first and making that the big one, our success rate clearly was like somewhere in the 60% range. And so, and of course, it's not one or the other, it's always all of them. Um, however, there is a so much a patient can do at any one time in terms of 
doing liver flushes, doing colonics, doing IV therapies, doing IV nutritional therapies and doing uh, oxygen therapies. And there's only so many things you can do. And depending on where you put your focus, the mix of things that you can actually do in a given day, especially if you're still able to work, it's limited. And so uh, the more we can nail it to the most important priority right now, the, the more livable life uh, will be quicker, you know, if, if you treat everybody for mold first um, and forget the Lyme disease and we get like the 10 or 15 percent um, dramatic improvements that we will get, but we're leaving 85 percent of people in the shadow. That's not my approach. Okay, so here's just a list of the typical co infections. So we got Borrelia with over 60 different common types. It's, Abcellii, and there's Myomotui now, there's Garinii, and there's Burgdorfer, Burgdorferi, you know, the one that we talked about last time with a little bit of a political spin on it. Then there is Babesia. Babesia is an, an interesting, for me, an interesting bug because I come from an area in Germany that was where Babesia is endemic. And then um, Steve Fry, you know, one of our, really our heroes in our field, uh, discovered Protomyxozoa rheumatica, uh, a form of protozoa, and he's gone very, very deep down that um, that channel where we find where he finds in the inner lining of the blood vessels of a chronic ill patient. You always find bugs, and this one is a very common protozoal bug that you find along with Babesia and along with other things, and even you find plant-based uh, organisms in there like algae and um, other weird things that you would never think about. And um, those of you who want to look in the future, try to follow uh, Stephen Fry. He's in, in the Phoenix area. He's a medical doctor with his own lab, Fry Labs. And he certainly, I feel, is one of the people that will lead us into the future. Um, Ehrlichia, um, I can get right to Rickettsia. Rickettsia is more well known and there is sort of some arguments about that, but um, it looks like Elikia really is a subgroup of Rickettsia. Rickettsia, the, the illness linked to it is called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And guess what? The most common place in the world with Rickettsia infections is the south of Germany and uh, the northern part of Switzerland, right? And it's called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Well, you know, the, Alp, the Swiss Alps and the Rocky Mountains were formed about in the same time on Earth here. And so there is a relationship. But um, Rickettsia are very, very, very common in the Basel, Freiburg area, where I am studied medicine, and Zurich, Switzerland. You know, everybody in my, I have a small Swiss practice at Swiss Biohealth. Those of, most of you probably know that by now. And I'm practice, practicing there several times a year. And the most common illness in the Swiss population is rickettsia. And if rickettsia causes a lot of pain, uh, then it involves ehrlichia as a subgroup of it. Um, there's a neoehrlichiosis. It's a term of the illness that was just recently named in Switzerland, but it's been around for a long time. Bartonella, um, I agree uh, with uh, the uh, physician friend who wrote that book, Treat Bartonella or die, um, that Bartonella seems to be causing the most serious of illnesses that we see, and also has turned out to be the most difficult to treat. And, and I'll get to that, I'll give, give you my solutions um, freely, you know, it's gonna be free for you. But um, Bartonella causes a lot of joint pains, and aside from the brain fog and all the brain related symptoms, but it's probably the most severe with the joint problems. and. Um, it's a blessing if you can find, if you have Bartonella and you find a physician like myself who is good with the needle and I would inject all your joints with ozone and probably would get you pain-free in a very short period of time. There is, you know, Frank Schallenberger, and there's Robert Rowan, there is a, a group of us old timers, the old uh, samurai guard in America that all do the ozone injections in the joints and um, I was amazed that actually it's very difficult in Germany and Switzerland to find somebody. There is some people, but they're all in hiding. 
and uh, it's such an easy and safe thing to do and so but anyway think of bartonella uh, it, on top of systemic treatments that you will need for bartonella this responds really beautifully to local ozone injections uh, to get the nests of the illness under control okay and then there is mycoplasma and i could sing a lot of songs about mycoplasma so mycoplasma is a cell wall deficient you know that each each bacterial cell usually has two cell walls of rubbery one that surrounds all the ingredients and then a hard shell around it to protect it and so but the hard shell comes with the problem that that has certain markers on the surface that the immune system of the host recognizes and then kills the cells. And so mycoplasma simply gave up that hard shell and only has a floppy rubbery membrane that looks on the outside very much like the body's own tissues. And so the immune system cannot recognize them. Yeah, and so they're called cell wall deficient forms. Um, and they're very, very common. And there is hundreds of types and Garth Nicholson was the main researcher who brought this to our uh, attention here in the US that the Gulf War syndrome was a mycoplasma infection or still is. And lots of uh, vets, you know, that have come back from uh, the Middle East uh, bring this illness to their families. And, uh, you know, most common symptoms are simply chronic fatigue, you know, but their children got chronic fatigue and their offspring got chronic fatigue. And it shortens their lifespan and increases their chances of getting cancer in their lifetime. It comes with a lot of downsides. And mycoplasma, Garth did a study on it where he showed when you <clears throat> treat people for mycoplasma with antibiotics and you give uh, two or three antibiotics at the same time and change the regime every six weeks, when you do that for a year and a half, you get a, about 66, uh, two thirds of people are cured of it or one third still has it. And so we decided to go another way with that. We do immunotherapy for that, but mycoplasma is extremely sensitive to ozone. Yeah, so there's another, this is more an indication of intravenous ozone therapy, but we use ozonated plant oils. You know, that is a key science, has the original formula from Professor Steidel in Germany. They're, they're ozonated plant oils, but not just ozonated olive oil, it's ozonated olive oil and castor oil, and then all the different essential oils, you know, that, that we use for like oil of artemisia, oil of uh, clove oil, the, the oils, the essential oils that are known to treat infections. And that's extremely effective to work with the rhizoles for, um, for chronic mycoplasma. It's extremely sensitive to that. It's usually the dose is 10 drops three times a day. There's a certain way of mixing the rhizoles with water. It's a reasonably pleasant tasting drink. And that takes only six weeks to get rid of uh, close to 100% of mycoplasma rather than a year and a half for 60% or 66%. Okay, viruses, of course, you know, when you get a tick bite, there is also viruses that are transferred. Um, I mentioned here cytomegaly and EBV, but um, it's, it's expanded hugely the spectrum of what is transferred with an insect bite. And then I like to differentiate between the co-infections. Co-infection means they're given to you at the same time as you got the insect bite that gave you Lyme. It also gave you Babesia or Bartonella or Ehrlichia or Mycoplasma or certain viruses. These are co-infections. They travel simply with the main bug uh, that is in there. And then there is opportunistic infection, which is different. These are the ones that come later because all the bugs on the top list here are highly, highly immunosuppressive. And so you're kind of doomed. Once you have this infection, you may not have any, inf any conscious symptoms. You may have all of these in you and not have any symptoms. The only symptom is now you're getting the frequent colds and sore throats. You get the coronavirus very severely. You get parasites. You get um, Epstein-Barr suddenly flaring up. You get all of that. That is because your immune system is down. It's, uh, we know that cells of the immune system themselves are invaded by Lyme spirochetes. They're in the white cells that are supposed to kill the Lyme disease. 
Lyme disease invades them, lives inside them. It's similar to the, the mechanism that Bill Gates is using to invade our groups, uh, but I'm not gonna go into the politics, but you, you can look at Lyme disease and know exactly what these gentlemen have figured out uh, how to get to us. Um, so the most common co-infection, common overlooked co-infection in Lyme disease is the chronic parasites. There is the lungworm, very strong, Elus clapawi, um, one of the main causes of chronic fatigue. It lives in the lung. It gives off some biotoxins that knock out certain parts of your bio, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain and makes you chronically fatigued, similar to the mechanism how mycotoxins can cause chronic fatigue. But this is one very hard to diagnose. You need to do a nasal wash with saline and then look under the microscope for hours to see it. And then there's no real treatment. Interesting enough that the treatment that uh, Dr. Klapau uh, came up with is the inhalation of pure alcohol that disrupts the life cycle of it. So I, I uh, tend to start my treatment of the chronic Lyme patient with looking at parasites. Um, parasites are often hidden under the mold symptoms. You know? So suspect um, somebody comes to you with a diagnosis of mold illness and they've done all the mold treatments, but they have had unsatisfying, they were not one of the 15% that respond to it. Think uh, that you're probably overlooking a parasite, that the mold is dancing sort of on top of the parasite. That like, the parasites are intelligent, they know how to hide in us and they cause a lot of symptoms. They cause immunosuppression, they, um, they manipulate your behavior, your feelings, your, your everything really. Okay, well, then there is the mold and the mold illness. I'm not gonna get into that very deeply, you know, sort of the aspergillus is probably the most well-known one, one of the black molds, um, cladisporium. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, do, do orient yourself, do read Richie Shoemaker's, uh, books and study his website. Um, he is one of the living geniuses, um, one of the most brilliant people that I've ever met. And um, what he's done, he's done. Um, he certainly has become the world expert on mold. And it's an easy one to orient yourself. You know, just go on his website. Um, I like the book uh, Mold Warriors, but there's other more recent things that he's published and his papers are of high uh, scientific quality, very, very difficult to read, but you, you get the gist of it when you read his books. Okay, and then the viruses. And so I like to say just a few words. Okay, so the more common viruses that most of you know is the herpes viruses, herpes simplex, um, the one that's the lip stuff, herpes, the genital herpes, um, then there's the Epstein-Barr and the cytomegaly, the, the, we refer to them as the chronic fatigue viruses, herpes type six, um, but not to overlook the uh, Coxsackie viruses are huge affecting the heart with cardiac Lyme disease. You know, the heart is affected, the, the heart muscle by Lyme disease often involves the Coxsackie viruses, which are nasty little creatures that uh, respond uh, amazingly well to 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, or even Prozac, you know, it's published, um, but otherwise very, very difficult to treat. The, all of them respond well to Alinea, which has been, those who have listened to my parasite talk, is one of my, my very favorite drugs because it gets rid of toxoplasmosis, it gets rid of most parasites. And then the, the big one that Judy Mikovits, I, I, I owe, my life to her, uh, Judy Mikovits was the one that alerted us in the think tank that no tick bite, no insect bite comes without transferring a good dose of retroviruses to you. Retrovirus is the most well-known one is HIV. And we're not talking about that one, but there's 600 others that cause <clears throat> what we call now, refer to AIDS minor, they, they cause, um, a whole variety of symptoms, but they're all similar to a mild AIDS patient. 
And many, or if not most, my patients test positive for retroviruses. I have a separate talk for that that I gave in this format here that you can um, get the record of, and um, you should. It's, it's a most important field of, of study because retroviruses are involved with all cancers. They're involved with all neurological diseases. It's, it's a common link between all the chronic illnesses, whereas usually there's a split, the cancers have certain rules and certain causes and the neurological diseases have other causes and other things to look for. But the retrovirus are common in both or a common foundation for illnesses to go forward. And so you need to know how to diagnose them and how to treat them. I use ART, I've gotten very good with that, but you can do CD26, you can do an agalase, uh, you can do RANTES, you know, these are the three major markers for it. And um, they will be positive in your chronic fatigue patients and chronic Lyme patients as an indication that you also need to include in your treatment the retroviruses. And if, if I had any grudge with ILADS and the leading groups teaching Lyme disease is that they focus on certain viruses, but they've overlooked the retroviruses because they're more difficult to diagnose. And admittedly, and uh, there is a big dispute about the treatment. You know, you know that I've developed some herbal remedies that I gave to different companies um, that, um, you know, the, the most common remedy, most well-known remedy is from Key Science. It's called Retro-V powder. And um, then uh, Biopure in, uh, in the US also has Bicaline powder. Um, which is the extract of um, one of the herbs that we're using um, that has been huge and, and the, that combination uh, in treating retroviruses. But there's medical drugs like Truvada and the, the whole AIDS type of drugs that, that can, um, can do wonders here and, and are needed. You know, we've, of course, yeah, I'm in a position in the US at the Sophia Health Institute where we see all the people that fail treatment with other practitioners. And so concentrated in my office are the people where the overlooked illness is either parasites or the retroviruses. And that's pretty much I can sort of start there and know I can land a few good successes very early on. Okay, so how do you diagnose the damn thing? Okay, <laughs> diagnosing Lyme by history. Well, the old thing was, well, did you ever have a tick bite? And if the answer was no, when I was, well, then it can't be Lyme disease. <laughs> but now, uh, knowing, having followed the literature, the question should be, did you ever have a mosquito bite? Did you ever have a spider bite, a flea or lice bite? Do you remember, um, you know, 15 years ago when your illness started, could it be that you had a mosquito bite just then? <laughs> well, in endemic areas, you know, up to 40% of mosquitoes have Lyme spirochete in their guts, in their stinging apparatus. <laughs> okay, and then the clinical findings, I mentioned it to you, the differential diagnosis that unfortunately Lyme can mimic, cause, or aggravate any clinical symptoms known to men. Um, and so it can be involved in any illness that you see, even breast cancer, prostate cancer, prostate cancer we find we did some biopsies and prostates are full of Lyme spirochetes. It's a very alkaline milieu there and the Lyme spirochetes love prostates. That is a whole thing that should be researched. Um, okay, then we have IGNX lab in the US. They, have, they were the pioneers with having uh, improved the Western blood test. And now we have a whole slew of, of test uh, of test kits, you know, largely the through the PCR technology, uh, we got the multiplex uh, Lyme test that tests for several of the co-infections all in one go. It's not that sensitive, but it, it it covers a wide spectrum of bugs as a search as a searching tool. Um, I still like the Western blot. It's a very reliable test. Um, my favorite lab is in Germany from Armin Schwarzbach, who is member of ILAD, so he's not an enemy. And he uh, followed the literature that's more available in Europe uh, and in, in the German language. 
Um, there is many things uh, that are in German that are not or never translated into English. Um, the you know the medical literature is dominated by a few American um, owners, and and so fortunately there is still a small subgroup of publishers in other languages that have refused to be bought up, and so following that literature, uh, Armin uh, developed the LTT early spot is a highly highly sensitive uh, test. And that has been our main tool for diagnosing Lyme disease. And then now we also use the multiplex and other additional tests to, to um, quickly get to the Babesia and Bartonella and Rickettsia and, and see if there's any other um, co-infections that are somewhere on the horizon. Now, some of you know, I developed this technique called autonomic response testing. Uh, ART. It looks on the outside like some form of kinesiology. It's not. It uses a completely different dynamics of the muscle to get to the answers, and it has become um, the main tool. And there's about 2,000 medical doctors right now in the world using it as a primary tool to diagnose very quickly and very reliably. Then there is the Lyme culture that uh, Joe Boroscano. Uh, close friend of mine was involved in developing that is definitely by our understanding of medicine in, in the proper way how medicine was developed not the bullshit that we hear the last year and a half but the proper medicine um, you should be able to culture out a virus you should be able to culture out a bug if it's really there now um I'm not going to say more about the viral thing, but you're probably getting my hint here. But with Lyme disease, it should be, if Lyme is real, it should be possible to culture it out. And these people have managed to do that. And so it's by far the most definitive test, but it's not acknowledged by the insurance companies or by the medical association or so. It's not, it's not rated as the most uh, reliable test, which it should be. Um, but the world has gone nuts in that regard. You know, there is no more common sense in medicine. Sorry, you know, it's gone really bad. Okay, so, and then there is the indirect test, the ELISA test, the CD57, the MELISA test. They're all tested looking at different immune responses and they tend to be unreliable. Like the CD57 was popular many years ago, but if you do the same patient, in the morning, at lunchtime, and in the evening, the value may go from like an, it, it should be over 100, right? And so it may go from eight only in the morning to 50 in the afternoon to 120 in the evening. And the next day, it may start with 80 in the morning and be at two in the afternoon. And so we've seen wild scattering of the test results. And so that's why I don't do it anymore. But I, I know it's still if you can find a low level it's still um, acceptable to many insurance companies to use it as proof that you have a chronic infection but another i still like fry labs you know they look with a microscope very carefully um, they develop a certain stain call it hemobartonella because they're looking at it in the in the blood and remember, I said before, the problem with Bartonella is it doesn't live in the blood. It lives in the joints and in your brain. And, but, you know, can you do a joint biopsy? Well, not easily. Can you do a brain biopsy? Yes, you can, but usually only post-mortem. And so um, Stephen has developed this beautiful test. Um, it's a smear on a glass plate. Uh, you send the, the blood there and you get a very, very sophisticated analysis back um, that, tells you what he sees in your blood and it's sometimes shocking <laughs> what he finds. So the most common uh, test for Babesia is the FISH test. Um, that is an immune fluorescence test. Um, and uh, it's unfortunately, it's quite insensitive. So a lot of people come back negative and they still have Babesia. And the problem there is the same, that Babesia doesn't really live in the blood Malaria does, it's easy to find in the blood, but Babesia only periodically lives in the blood through certain life cycles, but it lives in your brain and in the back of your eyes and it lives, uh, lives in the vagus nerve. You know, that's a very, very common infection there. And uh, in the solar plexus, it loves the autonomic ganglia. And, um, that, but that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for it in the blood. And so 
if you look in the blood and you don't find it, you cannot say that you do not have Babesia. The beautiful thing with ART is, with ART we can do non-invasive looking into the brain, into the eye, into the sinuses, into your heart and see what bugs are there through a principle called direct resonance phenomenon that was developed by uh, my mentor and teacher, uh, Dr. Omura in New York. Um, good, and then we developed our own way of testing uh, for Lyme disease. We, we use ART to figure out where what bug is in the system. And then we put ultrasound to that area to shake the area up. You know, ultrasound vibrates the cells at 12,000 Hertz or so. Um, and the cell wall becomes leaky and that, and the content of the cells leaks out and gets into the connective tissue and from there into the lymph and from there into the venous system and from there into the kidneys and from there into your pee. And that's where we can find it. And so I think I have a few examples here. Yeah. So this was a, a like it says here, 36 year old man with severe fatigue and brain fog was negative on all the tests for Lyme disease. But with ART, with our just manual muscle testing, um, tested positive for Borrelia and for Bartonella. And so we put ultrasound on the areas um, that, that were testing positive. And then we did the DNA, uh, a PCR test on the urine. And what we found was exactly the box that we predicted with ART testing. I published that you know, in the journal. I don't know if you have the journal article coming up here or not, but it's published in the, in the American Journal of Immunology. And it should have led to a revolution in testing for Lyme disease. That is not enough to just draw the, draw the damn blood or the urine in a patient, but you need to shake up the areas of the body where the bugs are. The same is true for diagnosing heavy metal toxicity. Um, I, I need someone like you guys listening you sort of to, um, to get excited about this. You know, we can do a beautiful test for heavy metal toxicity showing if you look for heavy metals in the blood and the urine, you won't find anything. But the moment you put ultrasound on the areas where the patient is drawing the heavy metals and then you collect the urine, it will be hugely full with it. And that needs to be published. It's a revolution in, in testing, but um, so far, uh, but a few people have followed my lead, my lead on this. Maybe it's because I got that strange, unpleasant accent um, from a different country in Europe. Um, so this, yeah, as it says, yeah, 25 year old woman with POTS and severe fatigue and brain fog. Again, uh, we tested, we put her through the drill with Igenex and um, several other labs. You know, we wanted to make a, a case out of this one. And then we did the ultrasound on the areas that we we're predicting. We found exactly what we were predicting with ART, that she was positive on Lyme, on Babesia, and Bartonella. So um, the article, I'm happy to, if you inquire to Klingon Institute, um, they can send you the, the article you know, where that was published. Um, this is, I think, a very important page for both laymen, but also for medical doctors who look at it. You know, so there is a couple of simple lab things that I immediately kind of hone in and um, it tells me to go forward with diagnosing Lyme disease or not. So first of all, we always see the moderate LDL elevation. This is the chronic Lyme patient who is not close to death yet. LDL plunges down just before our Lyme patients die. So watch out for that. The low cholesterol, low total cholesterol, but the low LDL, that's when we get worried. The insulin resistance we find pretty much in all of our Lyme patients at any stage. And we just keep it simple. I just look at the fasting glucose level in the morning. And if it nudges up into the high 90s, I know it's a home run. Then we have the borderline low white blood count. Um, normal in our world, the normal ideal level for a white blood count is 5,500. Anything above, you get acute infection signs. It's a signature of acute uh, engagement of the immune system with some offending agent. It could be a toxin, it could be a bug. If it goes down, 
it means breakdown of the immune system, non-functional paralytic state of it. And so um, when that goes low, you know, sort of we, um, we know there's several tricks that we can bring it up, just the regular dosing of vitamin C will, but also um, we want to look at the natural killer cell activity, not just if they're there, but they suggested in the US lab course paying for the natural killer cell activity, which is a very, very precious test that often goes together with this. But th just remember the low white blood count should trigger all of you thinking chronic infection, not acute, but the opposite chronic infection and leading amongst it is usually Lyme with all the opportunistic things that come with it, the parasites and the viruses and all that. Okay, these are uh, the next line here, that's Richie Shoemaker's line. Um, but if both C3A and C4A are up, um, that's Lyme, that's not mold. However, um, this test has to be done as a national Jewish hospital in Denver. They're the only ones that get it right. And that's still true today after 20 years. Uh, nobody else has called on to us. I like to highlight this one, MMP9. You know, these are metalloproteinases. These are enzymes that break down your protein. And I know several of my listeners today um, are concerned about um, their, their tissues and body breaking down, softening. That is a signature of Lyme disease. And I'll tell you why, because that's a fascinating part of it. Um, so there was a <laughs> race uh, constructed in a laboratory to see how fast do Lyme spiral kids move compared to white blood cells. And the conclusion was the, the Lyme spiral kids move 2000 times faster than our fastest white blood cells do. So this is like, you know, you're on a bicycle and you're trying to catch an airplane. Um, I don't think you're going to be very good. And so uh, they also tested, you know, the speed. Uh, if you put a Lyme spiral kit basically into the tongue, how long will it take for it to travel all the way to your genital area? Um, this is, you know, this is two feet. And the answer to that was about three seconds, you know, which is faster than, and that is not traveling through the bloodstream, but traveling through the connective tissue. But this is only possible if the Lyme has been present in you for a couple of years and has activated the metalloproteinases, which break down your connective tissue. So traveling for the bugs is much easier. <laughs> so the bugs basically hijack a few of your enzymes <laughs> and manipulate them to change your body in a way that you become a comfortable host, you know, where your tissues are soft so they can sneaking through the tissues at the speed of light almost. So anyway, I'm fascinated by, by some of those things because they're not that well known. Um, so usually we find low thyroid hormones, but um, even if they're normal, it's suspect that the patient is um, hypothyroid and we use the body, the wake up test uh, temperature under the arm, you know, it should be 97.8 or slightly above. You know, if it's below that, you're thyroid deficient. And there could be, that you have normal levels of thyroid hormones in the blood test, but the receptors on the cell are blocked. And therefore you need higher doses of thyroid hormone in order to stimulate the receptors so that it can get to the DNA where the thyroid eventually has to get. And then you got the whole conversion of you know, T3 uh, to reverse T3 that happens typically in the Lyme patients. And so everyone who is tested for thyroid with the suspicion of Lyme disease should be tested for reverse T3. You know, that's something the, the Lyme bugs have learned that trick also to corrupt the thyroid receptor. And so when, when um, T4 docks onto the cell, it's supposed to be converted to T3. And that is the active form that goes in the cell and, and stimulates the DNA to, to activate your metabolism. But if the thyroid receptor on the cell was corrupted by Lyme, it turns it into reverse T3, uh, which is non-functional and basically blocks the whole mechanism. And here's the reason why. There is a, a German study that shows by if you lower your body temperature by 0.2 degrees, your 
double the amount of pathogens in your body, where each point two, um, this was in Fahrenheit, point two degree um, lower body temperature, which is what low thyroid does, it lowers your body temperature. So for every point two drop, you double the number, you become a comfortable host basically. And so and of course the bugs have figured that out. So they're corrupting your thyroid receptor. And so you, you have to watch out for that. So the only way to know if your thyroid is, if the cells are stimulated by enough thyroid hormone is if you measure the body temperature. Yeah, and so there is that Wilson protocol. I'm not gonna go into that here, but there's, it's a huge issue. And so connected with that, this adrenal failure, um, we don't, I mean, it's assumed that the adrenal failure comes first and then uh, the thyroid have to become more active to make up for the lack of cortisol. You can kind of override that to a degree with, um, with thyroid hormone. Um, but we know that all the viruses that I mentioned before are attacking the adrenals and the adrenals are able to regenerate, self-regenerate. And the, um, it's a, how to regenerate the adrenals. It starts with meditation. It starts with light therapy through the eyes. It starts with energetic things and lifestyle things long before you, you want to feed the adrenals, you know, yes, with adrenal tissue, maybe with, uh, organ therapy, which the FDA has taken away from us about 15 years ago. Um, but you can also do it with certain herbs, you know, Bacopa and, and all the other ones that are out there, even ginseng. And there's so many plants that are beautiful in healing the adrenals, but they're not quick, you know, so it, it will take a while. Okay, and then there is the low alk fos, you know, that's pretty much in 90% of my Lyme patients that indicates uh, lack of zinc or magnesium or both. And usually when they're both missing, you're missing all the other minerals as well. So um, very common Lyme patients have a condition called KPU, cryptopyrrole um, disorder, also called, uh, well, there's different, different newer names given to it. Uh, look at the, the website from uh, the Better Health Guy, you know, um, he, um, my, my friend Scott has on his website, the article we wrote together on KPU, I think it's still standing as the best article, best paper. And you should, as a Lyme treating person, even if you're your own doctor, you should be aware of KPU. I developed a supplement called Core, um, and Core S, there's, there's two of them. Uh, that is a fantastic treatment. And KPU basically, um, Again, the, there's eight enzymes that are needed to create uh, the heme molecule, which is the most important part of all the phase one detox enzymes. And when, um, when you have these bugs in you, they're creating a blockage in one of these eight enzymes and you can't make the heme molecule. And what that means at the end effect, you're losing a lot of zinc and vitamin B6 in your pee. You're peeing out the most important things for your immune system. And so, and you cannot get enough in by eating. And so we've created a supplement called Core that you can get from Key Science, you can get it in America also from BioPure. Um, that is absolutely fantastic um, for making up for these losses. Um, that's 101 of, of treating Lyme disease, you know, and it's not um, that well known in the community. Okay, and so the last one on the lab thing is typically uh, most Lyme patients and most low uh, mold patients, I have to say, have an underproduction of antidiuretic hormone in the pituitary gland. Again, it has to do with certain neuropeptides that are blocking uh, certain pathways in the pituitary. And you, you will see that your urine will look like water. And you, you, many of our Lyme patients, you know, they drink water and it comes out five minutes later the other way and you can't hold on to it. And that's um, diabetes insipidus. That's a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone. And then there's uh, different ways of dealing with that. We, we, I do not recommend the drugs that are available. There is a sublingual drug 
called desmopressin that works well as a, as a trial, but it's not ideal. Something is not quite right there. And so we try to treat it uh, with different uh, vitamins and supplements and that goes beyond this talk here. I know um, my, <laughs> my time is up again. I just wanna end on this page. So I mentioned before, it's not just Lyme disease, it's not just ticks that transfer the bugs, but you have a, an article here from 1986 showing that deer flies and horse flies and mosquitoes in endemic areas, like the US is an endemic area, carry Lyme disease, carry Borrelia burgdorferi. And then there's another article that flees and <laughs> flee uh, under flea and mosquito borne diseases. They're mentioning Bartonella, Hemobartonella, Rickettsia. Yersinia, that's a joint uh, issue that we see in many patients. You know, so just wanted to make the point you know, that when you have Bartonella, like many of you who listen to this do, most likely you got it from a flea bite, but it could be from mosquitoes. You know, that's all that's needed is a one infected mosquito. And then it may take years for the numbers to grow in your system before it becomes symptomatic. And then um, here, Lyme disease masquerading as brown recluse spider bite. So we've had, maybe I end on a sad story here. <laughs> um, uh, an acupuncturist who worked for me was English trained, wonderful guy, uh, worked in Santa Fe as my acupuncturist. He got a spider bite in New Mexico, a brown recluse spider bite, and um, got a bit of numbness in the area and then more numbness and the whole leg went numb. Two years later, he was in a wheelchair, and a few years later, he died. You know, the diagnosis of MS, but it clearly came on after the spider bite. Now, I have to admit, this was 1986 when I was still very young at this, and I didn't recognize what was going on. And then he moved back to England where he had free medical service. So I couldn't help him when I knew more uh, about this. Um, I want to, you know, I know my time is up. Um, but I do want to mention a few things that you should keep in mind. One, everyone with Lyme disease and everyone with Corona has problems in the brain with brain fog, with um, memory issues, with, you know, um, emotional issues, um, the, the Corona thing, people's sex drive plummets to the to nowhere um and so i want to remind you that we there's magic in healing your blood vessels from the inside out and we do that with uh, ginkgo biloba with a wonderful tincture that i know it's available everywhere in the world i like the one that uh, biopure does um I would like to emphasize that the core or the core S, usually when you have a diagnosis of Lyme disease, you use the core S that's without manganese, but the core is a hugely important supplement if you have any of these illnesses that we're talking about here. Um, no, no one with Lyme disease uh, Lyme disease blocks the detox enzymes. And so one of the, the important um, co-treatments, the, the important things that you should keep in mind is that whatever you do with Lyme disease, you also have to detox. It's For us here, it's the Coriandolo Plus. It's the foot bath, the electric foot bath to pull the aluminum out. I will show you the literature next time uh, that makes it so clear that Aluminum is the growth factor for Lyme disease, and we get aluminum through the chemtrails, through the geoengineering protocol. You're inhaling huge amounts, supra physiological amounts of aluminum, nanonized aluminum every day. And so, in order to tame Lyme disease, to get on top of it, you have to detox. You have to use ginkgo to keep your blood vessels open. These are just some simple preconditions. And then um, I, I will ease you into the Lyme treatment, but it's this few preconditions and, and 
I often I get emails every day that people tell me, well, I'm doing your treatment uh, and it's not working. And then when I go through the details, um, <laughs> the half of it isn't done. Yeah. So our aluminum protocol is hugely important, also involves this herbal mix called Polmolo or Alutox in America. Um, I like to also, for most Lyme patients, strengthen the heart. Uh, we use the Crativus tincture. Um, I, you know, again, like I advise Key Science, I advise BioPure, I advise different companies, but I like uh, the Key Science has the uh, herbal productions in certain areas of the world where nobody else gets to. And the last thing I want to mention, um, I was just in Sardinia revisiting the farmer that grows the sisters that we're using. And we just went over the literature and over cases and over the traditional history in, in Sardinia. Uh, what we're using is the red sisters, sister, sisters Russell. And it's an incredible, powerful tool to tame Lyme disease, every aspect of it. And why that is, it's pretty clear because it's also published as a treatment for retroviruses. It's also published as a treatment for the common herpes viruses. It's also published as a treat as an antiparasitic, but it's a huge treatment for as a biofilm breaker. It's a huge treatment, direct treatment for Borrelia burgdorferi, and it's a red cystus that um, there's only one place in the world where it grows. And uh, there's only, right now, there's only one company in the world that has it, that's Key Science. And so um, I'd like to remind you of the Sisters Tea. It's not a small thing. This is a huge thing. And it's the second brew. So I know I'm over time, but it's a, so you do a first brew, you, you soak the leaves. Uh, if you want to make tea, you soak it for a couple of hours, and then you heat up the water, bring it to a short boil, let it cool down. That's your first brew. And you pour it off and you drink that. And then you pour water on it again and bring it up to a boil. And this time you simmer it for an hour and then the whole water turned bright red. And that's all the polyphenols and bioflavonoids that come out that have this incredible properties of healing. And so I'm just urging you, those of you who have not gone down the sister's tea route, um, please do that. It's, it's a huge tool and it's so simple and it is so effective. We've, you know, we have so, so many cases of, of people healing from that. And then usually uh, what I recommend those of you who've healed from Lyme disease, who, who believe you at a pretty good level that you've reached of healing, then try out the, the sister's tea and stay with that as a main staple of your nutrition. You have to drink something anyway, right? And coffee is, I'm addicted to coffee, I admit. It's good for my brain, but it's not good for the rest of my body. And I'm actually realizing that um, I'm doing fine with just one cup of coffee in the morning if I drink the rest of the day my sister's tea. And I can make that attractive by making it hot and putting some honey in it or some galactose, um, as I was prescribed by my personal doctor. And so it's um, it's a dance that that we all have to learn around Lyme disease. The last thing I wanna say is, so far, nobody has shown me proof that, um, that they can make a body Lyme free. And um, I like to say my last little bit here, um, the cysts are not destructible, they, they cannot be destructed. Uh, destroyed with, with anything known. They can maybe be weakened, they can maybe be kept in check, that they don't hatch out, but they're there. And so I like to show you the positive sign of a spirochete infection. We know that Mozart didn't die of some TB or so. He was treated for syphilis. He had did his most creative years. Uh, he did under the influence of spirochetes in his brain. Yeah, they had a different name and the syphilis spirochetes are maybe a little bit more aggressive, but he died of the mercury treatment that he did. He didn't die of, of some unknown disease. And there's various political reasons why that was hushed up. 
Beethoven didn't just lose his hearing suddenly and became deaf. He lost his hearing as a part of a successful treatment with mercurial compounds for his syphilis. These guys were the John Lennons and the, you know, the Freddie Mercury's of their time. And um, they're all, their creativity, their incredible, beautiful creativity was largely driven by the spirochetes in the brain. Um, the the um, Nietzsche, the most brilliant German philosopher, he's got syphilis and created the most beautiful philosophical work under that influence. So what I'd like to leave you with the thought is that a little bit of Lyme disease is probably natural to the human environment, to the human endeavor, and probably has driven creativity uh, in us humans for millennia. And maybe the incredible explosion of creativity in the last 200 years, maybe goes together with climate change and the emergence of ticks and deer flies and horse flies and mosquitoes uh, infecting our, us with these creatures that then potentially, if they're under, if, they're, if we have dominion over them, um, create um, certain aspects of creativity that we need to, to participate in evolution. It's just an idea, but I know I'm right when I'm, I, I know when I'm right, that I'm right. And so I know this is certainly part of what we have to consider here. And so we we will in, in the next lecture or two, when I come to the actual treatment of Lyme disease, I will um, make it uh, very clear to you that the idea is to find a happy medium between killing and between modulating our immune systems and finding a, a truce between us and the bugs that where we get the best out of the bugs and the bugs get from us what they need and that we can both be healthy uh, in, that, in that situation. So with that, I'll see you next week. Bye.